Hi, welcome to Sense 101 Life Club. My name is Dr. Kenyanju Nganga. In Sense 101 Life Club, we train, coach, mentor, and inspire people to achieve their God-given destinies. Sense 101 Life Club, inspiring generations. No man stands alone. Please tell your neighbor, no man stands alone. I read a story of a man who was lost in a hot air balloon. And looking beneath him, he noticed a woman and asked him a question. Where am I? And she replied without thinking twice, you are 1.27 degrees south and that is 6.8 degrees east. For those of you who know the geography, that's Nairobi City. And you are 5,000 feet above the ground in a hot air balloon. She, and uh, he looked at her and said, uh, you must be an engineer. She said, yes, I am. How did you know? Well, you've given me the location uh, in accurate details, but that information has not helped me at all. As a matter of fact, you've really delayed my journey. I would have progressed further, and you've wasted my time. And the woman paused for a moment, looked at the guy and said, you must be in management, aren't you? And the guy said, oh, yes, I am. How did you know? And uh, she replied, you know what? You freeze and high above through a large quantity of hot air. You don't know where you're coming from. You don't know where you're going. You are lost. <laughs> and somehow it's my fault, although you're in the same position you were even before you met me. <laughs> How often we like blaming other people for our own uh, troubles. When it comes to understanding others, we really tax our own imagination. It's easier to push the blame uh, to the other person. I was reading a book, How to Win Fred and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And in one of the writings, he said, you know what, I like ice cream. But for strange reasons, I realized that fish like worms. So when I went fishing, I never carried the ice cream, but I carried the worm as the bait because that's what the fish liked. How strange it is, he continues, that this little common sense has escaped the vast majority of people. And I want to start this meeting by suggesting something disturbing. Each one of us is selfish. We have some close interests to our chest. Nobody is interested with your success except you. It is maturity for you when you rise to that realization that for you to become a fisher of man, you must use a bait of what they like. You'll never sell your idea because each one of us has their own interest. I want to present to you some 10 key pillars to win relationships and friendships without taking advantage of people. But let me hasten to add, because this is the Valentine month, I will look at relationships both in the marketplace and at home. I'll look at how you relate with your own children, popularly known as parenting. I'll look at how you relate to your spouses. And for those of you who are having boyfriends and girlfriends, I'll look at it. I'll look at how you relate with your employees and suppliers of goods and services. I'll look at how you relate with the people who matter in your business, like service providers, like bankers, financial advisors, accountants. I'll look at relationships in a larger spectrum. Number one, are you ready? Number one, seek to understand, not to be understood. Seek to understand, not to be understood. I read a story of a man who was visiting a new neighborhood. And right at the entrance of this new neighborhood, there was a storekeeper. And he asked him a question, sir, how are the people in this new neighborhood? And the storekeeper asked him, but sir, how are the people of the city you are coming from? And the guy said, oh, terrible people, backbiters, mean, arrogant, rude. That's why I'm leaving that city. And the storekeeper looked at this stranger, the newcomer, and told him, I've got some bad news for you. The people here are mean, they are terrible, they are rude, and they are arrogant. 
In a couple of days, another newcomer was coming to that neighborhood. And he asked the same storekeeper, how are the people in the town you are coming from? And the storekeeper asked him a question, tell me, sir, how are the people of the city you are coming from? And he said, oh my God, they are gorgeous people, wonderful people, lovely, friendly. And the storekeeper replied, I've got good news for you. People in this city are gorgeous, lovely, and friendly. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we see people from our own lens. If you put on green lens, you see everything green. If your nose is smelling, you think no one has showered today. <laughs> you look at people from your own perspective, not from your own perspective. Even our own children, you see, when we were growing up, we used to stand up when a teacher was passing by. When I was growing up, there was only one TV channel, Voice of Kenya, highly censored, closing 11 o'clock, open at about 5 in the morning. When I was growing up, you're lucky if you had a TV set and it was properly black and white. When I was growing up, we used to stand up when a teacher was standing by. When we were growing up, we'd be punished for not trimming our nails or tucking in our shirt. Those were the challenges in our school days. Today, however, kids are struggling with substance abuse. Today, however, Right. By the time you leave that house, there's a Nigerian, an American, an Italian who is influencing the attitude of your child. We never had the mobile phones, leave alone the social media platforms that we have today. Therefore, I also suggest to the parents that are my voice tonight, you must seek to understand the environment in which you're raising these children. You must go to their level. You see, it is the greater that goes down to reach the lesser, not the lesser reaching the higher. If you build walls, people will not reach you. If you're in management and you're hearing my voice, it is for you to get out of that office and reach out to your subordinates. It is hard for them to stretch their arms to reach you. Maturity is that day when you come to this humble realization that the entire world comprises of everyone else with only one main exception, and that is you. The world never revolves around you. People have self interests. You'll only climb up when you realize that in every engagement you must have the idea of how you're going to better the lives of others. No one ever gets rich unless he enriches others. Working together makes the journey slower, but that is the only way of sustaining the work. Working together precedes winning together. There is no one in the history of mankind who reached the top unless he mastered the art of understanding others. It is Abraham Lincoln who said, I don't like that man, therefore I will seek to understand him. Every time you hear someone in the office say, they don't understand me, they don't feel me, they don't hear me, they still need to grow up. It is time I challenge Sense 101 Life Club, seek to understand, not to be understood. People have different temperaments. They are going through diverse seasons, changing fortunes. It is you to rise up to the occasion because average people want to be understood. Great people want to understand. This is the secret upon which the social elite reached to the top. It is a secret that toppled indomitable kingdoms. It is a secret upon which wealth was built. Believe me, friends, your certificates, your aptitudes, your talents, your giftings will not take you to the top. Your ability to relate with people. Business is done by people, for people, and through people. And the greatest secret of all times, whether you're building a church, a business, whether you're building a school, a college, whatever it takes, it is your mastery of dealing with people. Seek to understand, not to be understood. Number two, protect people's egos. Protect people's egos. On January the 24th, the year 2004, I had the rare privilege of speaking in a boys' school, Dream Stream School, on the theme Dream Killers. I did everything I could for over three hours, speaking to these young men on how to achieve their dreams. At the end of my presentation, a young man came over to me and said, thank you so much for encouraging words of wisdom, but I've already forfeited my dream career. Why is that, I asked. And the young man said, you know what? When we were in Form 1, one of our teachers asked us what we like to do in life, and I said, I'd like to be a journalist, specifically reading news in prime hour. And no sooner had the class ended, than one of the boys came over to me and said, excuse me, you just can't read news. What's wrong with you? Ever gone to the TV, look at the guys who read news, and then get back to the mirror and look at yourself squarely? 
Do you recognize this? No media house that can hire you, even if you're paying them to hire you. And the boy forfeited his dream career. In yet another school, I was speaking to students, form to students on the topic of sexuality. Same here. A young man told me I'm hated by my classmates. Obviously, I wasn't why. And the young man told me, you know what? They hate me. Why do they hate you? They say, I have a big nose. For almost 10 minutes, I talked to this young man and never realized the size of his nose. Don't worry, I have some good news for you. In about four years ago, he graduated from the University of Nairobi and the size of his nose has not yet changed. <laughs> he has somehow managed to live with it. Then I realized, it dawned on me that boys with low self-esteem are highly vulnerable to violence or violent language, trying to prove to their peers they are still around. Boys with high self-esteem need not prove their manhood to anyone. They are comfortable with who they are and they recognize their manhood does not reside in their muscles. A boy who is injured in his ego because kids just like adults get emotionally injured. It's a dangerous person you're raising. They might not reflect it right now, but they will get out of your arms sooner than later. Girls with low self-esteem are highly vulnerable to sexual promiscuity. Girls with high self-esteem need not prove their beauty to anyone around. They don't need anyone to confirm they are beautiful. They are comfortable with their stature, with their physique, with their looks, and they don't need their affirmation from the streets. It is your prerogative as a parent to form an emotional edge around your children. You must desist yourself from injuring them emotionally. But I say the same for the marketplace. Do not tear people piecemeal. You don't need to waste time trying to prove a point is wrong. In that boardroom, just take what you must take and learn to ignore what you don't need. You don't have to injure people emotionally. Now, you're too quiet on me, so I'm going to break it down. And I'll start with the engineer Kamaru. This is what I'm saying. Look at my eyes. Never, 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 never tell a woman that she looks six months pregnant unless you're 100% sure. <laughs> if somebody comes to supply to you, say some ballast, and they say, hey, I am a contractor. And then the guy, you ask the guy, by the way, where do you come from? I come from Kibera. Eh, eh, Ati, Ati, you may talk happy. Don't act shocked. That is how to injure people emotionally. Look. If you build high self-esteem amongst your employees, you receive results in record time because employees are on the front line of the business and customers are your bloodline. You must learn to protect everyone in your custody emotionally. Do not massage your ego. Learn to take corrections. If you cannot be corrected, you have an ego problem. Apologizing doesn't mean you're wrong and the other person is right. It only means you're the greater person. Great people easily say sorry. Minor people struggle to apologize. Will you take the charge to be the greater person in that relationship? Number three, treat others the way you want them to treat you. Treat others the way you want them to treat you. I realized long ago, everyone who comes for this meeting and many other meetings I go, we all have common interests. We like attracting senior people into our lives. We like attracting cabinet secretaries and governors and CEOs. In reality, however, you never attract who you want. You attract who you are. Like begets like. Like attracts like. You see, we have trains here in Kenya. And a train is nothing more but the aging of the locomotive. Everything else hooked up to the train. In the British language, they call them wagons. In America, they call them cars. They can be 20 or 100 or even as little as three. Now, the idea behind the English word train means whenever the locomotive moves, the aging that is, the wagons follow. They don't choose. If it turns right, they all turn right. If it turns left, they all turn left. They are trained in a given direction. Fathers were hearing my voice. To train means if you reach home three o'clock in the morning drunk, you are telling your son, don't make it at three, make it at six. 
fathers who are hearing my voice, if you are beating their mother, you are telling your son, don't leave it at the beating level, maim her leg. I've set the example. I've shown you the tread. In training, you don't tell people what to do. You lead them in what to do. Let me make it even tougher than that. If you're telling your children what to do, you're wrong. You should be leading them in what to do. In the words of St. Francis of Assisi, once he was approached by a parishioner with this question, Preacher, how should we preach? He replied, preach all the time. If necessary, use words. In the words of General Douglas MacArthur, perhaps the most popular general in the military history of the United States, a good soldier does not push, a good general does not push his soldiers from behind. He lead them from in front. He even once again said, never give orders that you do not expect to be obeyed. And I'll forget, you know, I've done a lot of speeches in schools for a long time. And I estimate over 400 of them. And in one of these schools, most of you could be familiar here in town, a girl was sent home because she was smoking. She came back with her mother about two weeks. And the mother, straight in the principal's office, went into her bag, bummed some two cigarettes, she lit her cigarette, and then gave the daughter one. And then asked the principal, by the way, Madam Principal, what are you talking about? And suppose you're the principal that day. In yet another school, a girl was given a skirt, and the severed girl she was, or at least though she was, she decided to trim it to size. The principal sent her home for two weeks to regain her sanity. She came back to school with who? Her mama. And the principal looked at them, mother's cut, daughter's cut, mother's cut, daughter's cut. And suddenly, the spirit of wisdom came upon the principal. And she replied to the mother, your daughter has deteriorated in academics. <laughs> what would you have said? Charity begins. You know, children are like tape recorders. They are not gifted listeners. They pick your non-verbal cues. They pick your lifestyle. And you pass it on one generation after another to four generations after you. In February next year, by God's grace, I'll be speaking on a subject known as where are our fathers. And I'll be challenging you to be getting me the fathers in your lives, whether they walked out of your life or whether they are still there. Because this is a question we need to answer as a country. And I'll be revealing some shocking statistics. I've done this talking about three places. And I can tell you the impact is great because we need to talk to our fathers. But I'm doing this topic at this particular month because it's the month of love. And I need you before you leave that door to love someone with genuine love. And I want us to make confessions before we leave that door, not to last after someone, but to love someone. And this is the process we have to go through tonight. Because you don't need to tell people what to do, you need to lead them in what to do. Parents tell. Good parents explain. Superior parents demonstrate, but great parents inspire. Even in the marketplace, do not give orders that you personally cannot obey. Do not tell your employees to turn up to work at 6.30 when you go at 8.30. Treat your employees the way you want them to treat your finest customers. In your absence, if you're used to insulting them, they will mess up with your business in your absence. If you give them the treat that they deserve, believe me, friends, in your absence, they will defend that business with their blood. They will defend it. Lead from the front. Lead from the front. Attract who you are. What language should you use? Let people know how you want them to treat you by how you greet them. Greet them by their names. Get to know people's names. But even more importantly, learn to smile when you're saying hi to people. Don't say it's natural with so-and-so. No, it's never natural with any of us. It is only that we know it's a tool of connecting with others. If you use a negative language with people, you are setting the tone of how you want them to treat you. Because what goes around comes around. And it comes back good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Number four, connect with others. Connect with others. And perhaps before I comment about connecting the marketplace, allow me to start with the most critical connections. I'll start with your own children and then the people whom you relate with. You see, I sadly read in the newspapers 
that when Professor Wagari Madai died, she said, the only thing I regret is that I never spent enough time with my own children. The only true Nobel 